All right. So it's 9.01, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, everybody here. Um, this is like kind of emotional for me because this exhibit is actually coming down in like a few days for, for forever. So this is like really cool that we get to share with you um, our process of making it. And I'm just, I'm, I'm excited that, there, that there's people here. So thank you. So to get us started, just kind of an orientation of what we're doing today. My name is Megan Weiss. I'm a program assistant at Utah Humanities. And I'll give you kind of an idea of what H2O Today is, its backstory, and our experience at Utah Humanities kind of scaling it for a state level. Then we're going to hear from Chris. He is the Director of Design at Insight Exhibits, which is a company based out of Salt Lake. And we'll hear him talk about its construction um, and design. And then we'll hear from Courtney. She is the Museum Curator at Hiram City Museum. And she'll talk about the experience of scaling each tour today for a uh, local community. And overall, our hope is that you learn a bit about kind of what services in, and technologies Insight Exhibits offers, but also the experience of taking this Smithsonian generated content and scaling it to your space and your mission, whatever it is. And you will have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so if you have questions, we, we can ask them then. So a quick overview, Thinkwater, Utah, hopefully you've heard of it before, but it, in, in case you haven't, um, it is a program presented by Utah Humanities and its partners. It's a statewide collaboration and conversation on the critical topic of water. So in the end, it consisted of 25 exhibits, 34 locations, and we reached an estimated 279,000 visitors statewide. And it's really rooted in this Smithsonian program called Museum on Main Street, which we've been involved in since 1994. And the idea with Museum on Main Street is you tour these nationally curated traveling exhibits throughout the state to small museums to generate community conversation and local programming. And in 2020 to 2022, we actually toured two Smithsonian exhibits. The Museum on Main Street, one was called Waterways, and the other one was this Build-It-Yourself exhibit called H2O Today, and they were both from the Smithsonian Institute Traveling Exhibit Service. So here's the five H2O Today host sites, and we got some of them here. Ooh, H2O Today people, I see you in the back. Um, and we actually ended up partway through extending our tour of H2O Today. And the idea with these exhibits is you're taking this kind of rich Smithsonian resource and you're anchoring it in place-based storytelling through companion exhibits at the local museums and programming at the local host sites. And you'll see more of an example from that when we hear from Courtney in a bit. Um, but obviously, a show today, its development was truly a team effort. And I'm like so touched that there are people in this room, like so many of you have like helped in some way with this crazy project. <laughs> and we also did it during COVID, which was crazy. So um, thank you again for being here to hear about it. And I'm gonna share more about how it came to be on our end. Then we'll get into details about design and application from Chris and Courtney. So backstory, these are not pictures of H2O today in Utah. This is actually um, pictures from Maryland. And it was kind of an example of what it could look like in a space that inspired us to take it on in addition to waterways. H2O today, like I said, it's organized by the Smithsonian, but it's actually based on an exhibit written by the American Museum of Natural History in New York and their partners. And that really was also an international team of collaborators. So they had the Science Museum of Minnesota, Great Lakes Science Center, the Field Museum, the National Museum of Australia, the Science Center in Singapore. So all these people went into curating H2O Today. The way that it worked is we paid the Smithsonian for copyrights to um, image files of the exhibit. So they gave us print-ready graphic files and InDesign. They gave us um physical interactive designs in adobe access to digital interactive software that you could like upload onto a tablet and things like social media and program materials that are all kind of smithsonian branded so the idea is it's really a build-it-yourself exhibit um, with all of these things and in terms of what it's about 
It is about water in all ways. Water in our lives. Water, water, the significance of water. It talks about everything from baptism and farming to overpopulation and climate change. And we found reading H2O today that it definitely, since it was written by this international community, it was definitely pretty broad. And we found too that it was a little East Coast leaning with some of its examples. So we worked really hard to adapt it to Utah and the American West because water is so weird here, <clears throat> or it's so, Utah is so unique. So in terms of scaling it, um, this on the left is Utah Waterways. It is a 40 page essay that we published. It's a deep dive into Utah's water history from prehistory to contemporary times. So this publication was free to visitors at each exhibition site and it also had a teacher's guide. And um, if you want a copy, they have some out on the table. And it was written by our state scholar, Greg Smoke. He is a historian at the University of Utah, and he's also giving the keynote today. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, but truly, this essay formed the backbone of H2O Today's Utah content, which ended up consisting of Utah-focused panels intermixed with the original graphics and made distinct with an orange stripe. So if you see here, this is the first install at West Valley's Cultural Celebration Center, and that orange stripe means it's a Utah panel. We also interspersed some photos and like little call out facts that were also Utah specific, and all of this had to be approved by the Smithsonian um, before we printed it. In terms of our like step by step process, we started with a content audit of everything in the script, just kind of going through and seeing. What did we like? What did we not like? Um, how does this connect to Utah examples? And then we adapted that Utah Waterways essay into exhibit text. We also had a photo tracking document. That's what, that's what this is up here. And with that, we kept track of what photos could go on what panels. And we also had to keep track of the image credit um, because it's an exhibit and we want to give credit. And also the Smithsonian required we report that. We also kept a fast fact tracking document. So we wanted to keep track of these kind of fun facts. Like here it says less than half of Utah's meager 13 inches of precipitation falls as rain. That's a crazy fact. So we kept track of those and also the sources that we got those from so we could kind of plug them in throughout. Um, it took us several rounds of panel editing and write-ups and I'll go more into the breakdown of panel to panel how we did that. But first, we also did an audit of the interactives. I won't say too much about these because you'll hear a lot more about them from Chris and their, how they were built. But we really did have tons of interactives that we didn't do um, just because of COVID times or if it applied to Utah. But with the ones that we did do, we still had to make them Utah focused. So we had this Ode to Water magnet poetry wall. It had, that's kind of what it looks like there. It had 300, almost 300 words in the end. We received most of them from the Smithsonian, but then we added in these Utah specific words like arches and seagulls and wasatch and watershed, things that are really specific to here. We also had this how much water flip up wall where um, you'll hear more about how it worked from Chris, but with these examples, we had to plug in uh, Utah things. So we did fry sauce, how much water goes into making fry sauce. Um, we also did an artificial snow blower. We did an NSA data center, because there is one here. Um, and we did hand sanitizer too, because it was COVID times. But yeah, we'll hear more about interactives from Chris, but one last one. This is this floor map. This is the crown jewel, as Chris said, of our exhibit. This is the best part of H2O today. And I just wanted to give um, a bit more insight into how we designed it before Inside Exhibit is printed it. We deliberately left out easy identifiers like I-80 or I-15, instead opting to split the state into these two watersheds. Great Basin and Colorado River, and then make all of the waterways, so rivers and lakes, really blue, so they really pop out. And we also put in Bureau of Reclamation dams, current water infrastructure, and proposed water infrastructure, so people can see kind of how water is just being moved all over the state across watershed boundaries. And down here at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it, but that's the Lake Powell pipeline 
a crazy long one. So those are the interactives. Now, um, kind of a section breakdown. Um, section one was called the water planet, and this was about shaping the climate, the importance of fresh water as, and water as like an architect and sculptor. So obviously we honed in on how Utah's environment is affected by water, how do Utahns get water, and we call this panel the land of extremes. So we talked about arches and how Utah's landscape is kind of shaped by water, but we also talked about kind of the scarcity of fresh water in the desert, so things like flooding in the south, but also um, the importance of watersheds and how people kind of gather along the Wasatch Front where watersheds melt and provide fresh water um, that is so critical for population growth. The next section is called Our Water, Our Home, and this is all about transport and recreation, food and work, faith and art. So this is kind of the humanities side of water, and um, we really wanted to hone in on how religions and cultures in Utah connect to water. So we focused on native creation stories. There's kind of this theme across Utah tribes of when the world started, it was covered in water. And then you have these mud diver stories of muskrat or otter diving down and bringing up mud. And that's what created the land. We also talked about the Mormon cultural landscape and this idea of making the desert blossom as the rose and how irrigation and canals were so important to that process. The next section is called ripple effects. The kind of main idea with this one is everybody lives downstream. We are all connected to each other. It's about water in agriculture, water industry, water in our homes, how water connects society. And we wanted to hone in on how water powers Utah, infrastructure projects, and all their controversies. So we called this panel Use It or Lose It, which is based on Utah's weird water law where if you don't use it, you lose your rights to it. And we use that to also talk about John Wesley Powell, who had this alternate alternate vision of water allocation in the West that was rejected in favor of these massive infrastructure projects. The next section is called Rising Tides, and this is kind of the sad time panel. It's about glacier melt, population growth, water conflicts, pollution. We wanted to hone in on, um, honestly, when we first looked at this section, we actually didn't really know what we would talk about, um, but we decided we really cared about illustrating the disruption of Native life under cellular colonialism. So talking about displacement, land allotment under the Dawes Act, and the decimation of Indigenous wildlife. So that's what we focused on. We called this panel Corn to Cotton. And we talked about um, ancestral waterways with the Fremont and Puebloan people, but also how displacement and disruption has echoes to today. So it's not exactly the same modern examples, but it's historic examples that have like modern um, influence. And then the next section, this is the last section of H2O Today, is called H2O Today, H2O Tomorrow. And this one's about climate change, threats to the ocean marine debris, but it's also, it ends on kind of a positive note. It talks about alternate energy solutions, innovative sustainability. And for this panel, um, we talked about Great Salt Lake as the canary in the coal mine for climate change. Honestly, if we wrote this panel today, we probably could have done it totally differently because things have changed so much in the realm of advocating for Great Salt Lake. Um, but yeah, we also talked about um, kind of hopeful examples of sustainability in Utah, such as the Jordan River cleanup. This is, an, this is just a sneak peek into our editing process. You can see we were breaking it down panel by panel into the N dashes and the text font and the text size. And thank you, Insight Exhibits, for putting up with our meticulous edits. <laughs> this, but this is how you got to be when it's like, going on a really nice exhibit. So that's kind of how detailed we got. Um, and then in terms of what we provided, um, I, I do want to emphasize this was also a team effort. Um, we provided these family and self guides that augmented H2H Day Utah with more Utah content and got the visitor to think a little more critically, engage a little more deeply with the exhibit. And these were written with the help of Virginia, who I think is here. Thank you, Virginia. 
I, I pulled up this family guide. We had a family guide and a self guide. I really like this family guide though, because here on the side, it has this cyanometer. So the way that works is you can hold it up to the sky and depending on the shade of blue on the cyanometer, it can tell you how humid the air is. So it's kind of cool. We also had these Spanish translations of everything. Um, these were provided in the galleries at all host sites for most of the host sites. And um, we also did a Spanish translation of the family guides and self guides as well. So that's the Utah Humanities angle. Now we're going to hear a little more from Chris and Courtney. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Weed. I am the design director at Insight. Uh, I, I was the designer on this project. I wasn't the director yet, uh, but now I am. Look for applause. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but Insight has been around uh, since 1980. Um, we provide uh, design services. We're, we're a full service exhibit house. We pro provide design services, uh, production, project management, and on-site installation uh, and coordination. Uh, within the museum industry, trade show realm, and corporate event. Um, so as far as some of our, uh, you know, portfolio projects, uh, we've worked on the LDS Church History Museum, uh, Clark Planetarium, Fort Douglas Military Museum, Discovery Gateway Children's Museum, USU Hall of Honor, uh on and on and on um uh, oh yeah wait oh, this yeah <laughs> so uh when we were approached by utah humanities um about this exhibit we had kind of outlined some uh, objectives uh that we wanted to hit which was modularity obviously the the exhibit needed to be um, flexible uh, and able to be rearranged for you know various venues and different layouts. Um, we wanted it to be you know somewhat sustainable. You know, obviously, a, a, an exhibit talking about how precious of a resource water is uh, to not have this have a large uh, you know, carbon footprint uh, or you know, stain on the environment. So, um, and then usability at the time, you know, in the throes of COVID, we needed uh, our booth to withstand frequent cleanings um, and then also uh, be able to be uh, used or uh, all of the interfaces be uh, used with a stylus here. Um, by those who wanted to use it. Uh, and then portability, obviously, too, because of uh, how much it was traveling through Utah. Uh, originally, it was three sites that we had um, established, but then grew to five, which was awesome. Um, and uh, not only different configurations within various layouts, but storage demands for uh, extra extra uh, handouts and then also pallets, crates, uh, stuff for, you know, logistic purposes. Um, so as Megan had mentioned, we had been provided a ton of graphics, a ton of uh, graphic work, and then also um, some precedent of um, interactives in other spaces. And uh, through, you know, this is much more of like a more permanent installation, I'd say. It's, uh, so we kind of took that as an opportunity to um, basically use a system that would be self-sufficient and kind of freestanding and be able to be reconfigured uh, depending on the layout. So uh, we used a product, B Matrix, which um, we're the second largest supplier in North America. And it's a toolless aluminum extrusion wall frame system that allows uh, yeah, rigid and fabric print options. So it's kind of like a, for some of you an erector set for maybe my generation more like connects or um, 
but uh, it's really cool. I mean, it, uh, it has all of these holes around the side of the frame. That's a, just an example of, of one frame. Uh, and then these toolless connectors, which are really nice. Part of the original um, kind of plan for the design was that each host site would set up the exhibit themselves. Um, so we wanted like a really user friendly product that they could, um, you know, that they could use themselves. So these are two list connectors and here's kind of a, an example of how those frames uh, connect together. Adjustable feet, all, you know, all buildings, the floors are not level and having, you know, large wall panels uh, can get kind of shaky. So that helps, you know, keep things uh, standing up and then here's kind of an example of this hinged uh mounting plate or se securing plate uh that basically allows you to break beyond 180 90 degree uh connections and then on top of that we uh decided to finish the exhibit yeah, yeah with uh with seg so seg is a silicone edge graphic um it's basically just a printed fabric with a silicone gasket sewn into the edge uh, so that you can um, insert it into uh, these little channels on the edge of a B matrix frame. So you can build these large wall panels with seamless graphics. Uh, so this material in combination with the B matrix was great because um, it's lightweight. It collapses flat. I mean, there were, I think, three pallets total for this entire exhibit. Uh, so the storage demand wasn't extreme. And here's some kind of early iterations uh, of layout. And here you can kind of see some of the different configurations that this product can be um, you know, configured to. Um, And here's kind of the final layout uh, for the West Valley uh, Cultural Celebration Center. Um, so you can see kind of all of these B matrix frames. This is all, this can all just be reoriented however it needs to be for any space, which is, which is kind of nice. And um, this, you know, we, we kept all of the sections together. Um, in order to kind of create these like anchor points within each space and uh, so that depending on uh, where you know where the exhibit was uh, moving to that we could sort of create sight lines and uh, some flow within each space. So yeah the interactive so this uh, this water bottle uh, this water bottle wave wall was pretty cool. Um, it's just, it's a B matrix frame in the back with some plywood, with a plywood base. Um, one of the opportunities we saw uh, that we could make it a little bit more user friendly and able to travel was uh, that these bungee cords with uh, uh, water bottles, soda bottles from our shop, uh, that they have uh, some quick connections. So this whole thing can just break down into, you know, be flat packed. And then on the reverse side uh, is the poetry wall. So with this, we just, before applying the fabric, we finished it off with a really thin sheet metal um, so that we could make this magnetic. So these, these magnets are just sitting on top of a fabric. Uh, the flip up or the everything uses water, sorry, yeah, everything uses water wall uh, was pretty cool. So the, the original um, design had a rigid substrate and since we were going with this fabric, uh, we decided to just make this uh, flip up panel out of fabric as well with the um, silicone gasket on the bottom to help interface with that stylus and then also to withstand frequent cleanings. Um, so you walk up to this wall and you flip up this uh, piece of fabric and you can see that fry sauce takes X amount of water to, to make. So that was a really exciting exhibit. Oh, yeah, you can kind of see that right there. Um, and then the uh, flip book. So there were uh, three, there were three flipbooks that came with uh, the Smithsonian content. 
Um, and again, just in order to integrate it into the system uh, so that each flipbook, if uh, it could stay with the uh, section that its content applied to, and then just, you know, something that can be sprayed down with whatever cleaner as much as possible. Um, here's a good look at the story wall. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, this was this was great. One one oversight probably is while we made this cabinet um, short enough that kids could use it really well, uh, putting markers and fabric next to each other is not not the greatest plan. Uh, <laughs> So there, yeah, there were some young graffiti artists, and uh, but yeah, we we kind of accommodated with COVID, you know, in this instance by having like a fresh pens, fresh marker, used marker um, cup. So, and then the microscope. Um, so yeah, this this looking back, I think probably we we had a there were some shortcomings with this for sure. Uh, usually microscopes are used with slides so that you can tell what's going on within, uh, within the sample. Uh, and in order to accommodate for COVID, we uh, used this kind of lazy Susan uh, turntable system with, uh, with an acrylic uh, kind of catch with Petri dishes. Um, and then, you know, so that basically kids uh, or, you know, patrons of the exhibit could uh, move this, this turntable around looking at various samples. But some of the pitfalls that we experienced were the, with all of these layers of acrylic and Petri dishes uh, that adjusting the microscope to actually see stuff within the water samples was, was pretty difficult and kind of broke those you know, kind of original objectives with COVID um, because you would have to manually adjust the microscope. And then, yeah, like I, like I mentioned before, that we, we had originally anticipated um, that each uh, host would be setting up the booth themselves. Uh, but then as we got through design and, you know, the kind of the sheer scale of the project that um, it was clear that we would step in and go, you know, go out to every site and set things up because it was becoming a bit too uh, complicated. But for each host site, we provided uh, setup kits to help kind of clean, maintain uh, the booth. Uh, so we had a digital media kiosk uh, kind of troubleshooting guide um, various cleaners, and since we were, were working with fabric that gets packed up, uh, a steam cleaner, which is really helpful on site. And here's a look at setup. Um, this all, yeah, gets set up within, I think, about five hours. Um, so it's a just a super user friendly system, and uh, you just you know, these walls go up within just a couple of minutes and then fabric goes up on top. And we'll look at some floor plans uh, throughout the various sites that we had the exhibit at. Um, so you can kind of get a feel for a lot of these, you know, maintained their same shape, but they would be able to be reconfigured if, you know, we had a site that was, split up within, you know, different rooms. And uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to you, Courtney. Hello. I'm going to talk about two different things, so I'm sorry if there's a flow problem. Um, hello, water joke. First, I'm going to talk about how we. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, first, I'm talk about how we adapted this exhibit to our region and scaled down into the local stories to tell complete um, companion exhibits and programming. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how all these elements that Megan and Chris designed worked in our museum. So the original plan, 
I was on the Council of the Bear River Heritage Area, which is, encompasses seven counties in Northern Utah and Southeastern Idaho. And we were set to partner with the Higher Institute Museum to have Smithsonian the Smithsonian Museum on Main Street exhibit Waterways in early 2021. So we started planning, and um, we were supposed to open at our site in, uh, I just said that, in early 2021. We began planning in fall of 2019 and training in spring of 2020. Um, there was no good way to plan for a statewide tour in the spring of 2020. So our organization took the opportunity to pivot to H2O Today, which was a similar national Smithsonian exhibit about water with localized Utah content directly in the exhibit. This gave us more time to develop our companion exhibits and programming and allowed us to have the um, exhibit for six months, which is a really long time. Waterways was a six week tour. So we were able to just do so much more over this six month period of time. And originally we were the last stop on H2O Today planned and it was scheduled and expanded after we started hosting it. Um, because the Utah content was already in the exhibit, it made it easier to share more localized stories in depth because we didn't need to include greater state level context. So when we started this project, I was the secretary in the Bear River um, Heritage Area's Council. And after our very first training, which I was not prepared for, I even took a pen. I had to borrow a pen and paper to take notes at our very first waterways training. But I had four sheets of paper that looked like that, in which as we were going through the training, I just wrote down every potential water story I could think of in the entire region, um, historic, modern, recreational, as well as potential partners within the region that we could partner with to make programming. We then, as a leadership team, we had four people, and we put those into themes and then started playing what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so we sorted all of the ideas and brainstorming I had into themes and then played matchmaker with partner organizations and stories. We eventually ended up with this lovely calendar of events, which is two-sided, that encompasses the final product. But as we were planning, we need to look at where the gaps were. Our end goal was to illuminate local heritage and traditions through water stories. And part of that was determining which stories were absent and undertold. The Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation um, was building a cultural heritage area and it was not going to be ready by the time we opened waterways and eventually H2O today. Um, because the Bear River Heritage Area is a heritage region made up of the watershed of the Bear River, and the Bear River is the source of life for the Northwestern Band of Shoshone, representing physical, cultural, and spiritual experiences both in the past and today. We needed to include that story. Oh, we're not going to go to that one quite yet. Uh, so the Hiram City Museum was creating a companion exhibit to H2O today, and we had a wall of space ready to use. And the tribe had a story, but no space. So we gave them our space to tell the story. Um, I technically, hold on, wait, sorry. I technically wrote the exhibit, but with a lot of help from Darren and other tribal members across the state. Thank you so much. If you listened to Darren talk yesterday, this exhibit encompasses a lot of what he talked about. Um, as well as working with USU's restoration team, team, we made a conscious effort to use phrasing and termino terminology of the tribe. When Darren was talking yesterday, there were certain words that he said over and over again, like respite and rejuvenation. And the words I had titled my sections of my exhibit. And I don't remember, I probably consciously did that, but I forgot I did that. <laughs> or it was so ingrained in me that um, it just happened. The goals of the exhibit were to educate our audience about the importance of the Bear River to the sustainability of the Shoshone people and that tribal members continue to interact with the river. The Northwestern Band of Shoshone is an active tribe with over 500 members and that the history of Cache Valley, Valley begins with Native Americans, which not everyone realizes. <laughs> so in order to develop companion exhibits, the Bear River Heritage Area had our own cohort of museum interpretation initiative. Five small museums within the Bear River Heritage Area received comprehensive training following best practices and standards of excellence. Brigham City Museum, Stokes Nature Center, Newton Arts Commission, the Cash Daughters of Utah Pioneer Museum, and the Hiram City Museum, as well as auditors who created their own traveling companion exhibits, used this program to develop, many of which are now permanent exhibits at their institutions. We were able to offer specialized docent training to all the MAI cohort members, as well as other organizations and museum docents and volunteers within the area to, um, to give interpretive tours and running hands-on educational programs. Thank you, Virginia, for 
coming and teaching us all this wonderful stuff. The community, the study about the community involved, docents excited and enthused and gave participants the opportunity to develop a specialized skill set. We had over a dozen companion exhibits and art shows, including the five developed directly through MII. So these slides are going to be fast and just this is all of the programming we put together. And then here are some of the exhibits that came out of this. We had presentations and lectures, including Greg Smoke talking about the Bear River and Utah waterways, which you'll hear more about at lunch. Um, Ms. Megan was talking earlier about developing the content for the Utah panels. I noticed some of the titles of programming like the Desert Shall Blossom of the Rose. That was a section, it, a Utah section in the HGO Today panels. So we took the themes at the state level and brought them into our programming again. We also did tours of like the wastewater treatment facility, a hydroelectric power plant, and the steam tunnels at USU. And oh, the photo is missing. It's just the calendar program. So we also had educational programming. <laughs> There's Virginia Capital teaching children how to make watercolors on their own. Because of COVID, we had to learn how to do programming at home and how to use resources you have. We also had an incentivized passport program to encourage visitors to attend a variety of programming. There are five types of programming plus dedicated social media platforms, including water infographics along waterwise themes, including Slow the Flow Friday and Water Wednesday, which it is today and is still going on in the state archives for that. Um, in the end, we put it all together and we have a thorough telling of our region's water story told through collaboration with different entities. We are able to provide training and resources to our partners that they wouldn't have had without H2O Today. As you can see from this map and partner list, we had a fairly thorough geographic and thematic coverage through a diversity of programs. <laughs> <Don't make it. laughs> now we're going to switch tracks and talk about how everything worked within the Hiram City Museum space. We had a lot of interactives. Uh, you can see there's the people looking at the list of all, Megan and Jody Graham. And I put the one on the left because this is where we had our self guides ready for people to take both in English and Spanish with signage and a kiosk. And this is their welcome into our museum. Kids really, really liked the microscope. Um, as was mentioned before, there were some evaporation issues and scratching on the plexiglass. But we actually got a new top mid tour, which is right there, that has holes to see directly into the petri dishes. Um, so there wasn't an extra surface and you couldn't see the scratches anymore. We got water from six local sources to um, put in this. And we opened in August of 2021. Two weeks after we opened, Hiram Dam State Park closed to swimming and recreation because of E. coli in the water. We had water from Hiram Dam Reservoir. And the number one question I got was, is this the E. coli water? And it was not because we had collected it before that and had enough to keep refilling. So no, we did not have E. coli water in the museum. <laughs> this, oh, why are my pictures working? <laughs> this is a Utah floor map. It was so, everyone loved it. It's, everyone loved the Utah floor map. Everyone wanted to engage with it. People didn't think you could walk on it. Here's us doing some training and everyone standing on the map. Yes, we're in a group talking, but it, People are hesitant to just go on it, but you can. Um, I loved that the roads weren't on it because it made you think about where you are in the state. It challenged you a little more without those roads there. Um, forgot to reprint Hiram on it when it was reprinted, but the dam was on there. So that was important. Um, and people just really like to look where they lived, where they've been on vacation, where grandma lived and point out different places in the state. So it was just great. We had, Oh, sorry, we had four different kiosks at one point. There were two with um, Smithsonian H2O Today content with water stories. And um, my favorite was the Beehive Archive because when I turned it on for the first time each week, I got to like interact with the new story because it's weekly. Um, we also had one that was called Waterson West, which was like a really complicated Sim City water thing. It was really hard to engage with. The iPad updated and the software didn't work anymore, so we just put it away and sent it back because like three people ever interacted with it and no one got to the point that they actually did anything with it. So that was okay to go away. But the Ojo Water, another one people really liked. Um, it usually wasn't this full. I took this on the last day of the exhibit, so that's why it's really full. The water drops were big, so we stored about a third of them away and didn't get to use them all. And then we put our own table there. Um, this book by Logan, uh, Logan's poet laureate, Star Colbert, and she came to the opening and gave me a copy of this poetry book. 
It's called Walking the Bear. And the very first poem in it was following the Bear River from its origins in the High Uintas, meandering to its tributaries and ending in the Great Salt Lake. And I loved it. Um, I had copies printed at the front desk that if people really engaged with this or whatever, I handed them copies of the poem because I thought it was just lovely and so regional and just important. I wish I had been able to incorporate it more. I don't know how, but I liked that I had that resource for people. Um, your water story was another favorite. Um, as Chris mentioned, a uh, previous site had some marker issues, but we had washable markers, so we'd never had a problem with it. And we had a new reprint, so it was okay. Um, the only thing is our markers were neon, so they were a little hard to read, but they were also multicolored, so people drew lovely pictures. Um, we had a binder to track damage reports and condition reporting throughout the thing, and it originally, you can see it's just the three sites, because we were the last one. Um, the only complication was because of the way the exhibit was designed, the frames got put up in different places. So if someone noted that a frame was scratched or stuffed, it wasn't going to be in the same spot in our museum. You might not have known that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that wasn't a big deal. None of them were really majorly damaged or anything. It, just a note. Um, but one thing that did happen is we had these lovely H2O Did You Know Centro circles on each panel, and they got packed wrong or something. I don't know what happened, but they arrived with missing some things. So as you can see right here, there's some scratches and there's letters missing up here. Um, but we were able to get new graphics printed and put on, and you can see it's perfectly fine there. And it was just vinyl, put on it, filed down, easy peasy, and it looked really good, like beautiful. After H2H today, we still have the floor mat and still use it. And um, this is our, oh, um, this is our kids trick or treating last week, so it's still there. It's still a favorite. Well, so, that has become our permanent Shoshone exhibit. We are just working on getting it printed once I figure out some case issues. But I've made a virtual version that is now available on our website, and it it looks so beautiful on the website. <laughs> so go check it out, especially if you want to know more about what Darren was talking about. Our impact: We reached more than eleven thousand visitors over six months. We had 33 partner organizations, 13 exhibits in 23 locations across seven counties in two states. There were 20 pu public programmings and trainings, as well as our incentivized passport program and dedicated social media. The overall project H2O Today in the Bear River Heritage Area, <laughs> sorry, Megan, um, won a Leadership in History Award of Excellence from the American Association for State and Local History this year. This award had a big impact on the small organizations within our area by giving them legitimacy in telling their local stories, as well as building capacity and providing funding and training to develop interpretive permanent exhibits, as well as training for educators and docents. Our partners were able to use the project to grow and continue to do what they were already doing, but with more resources, following best practices and standards of excellence. It really meant a lot to the community and collaboration was key to this, to this success and we could have done this without such amazing writers. <laughs> Sorry, Megan's like crying. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read the statement from the award because it just summarizes everything so beautifully. Inviting communities to create exhibits on water use and cultural meanings, offering multiple perspectives on contemporary water debates and demonstrating the relevance of history to contemporary concerns made this project a model for inclusion and localizing national issues. Um, and as you can see from those headlines, like it had an impact. We were still figuring out, but it just, it was a big deal. It was awesome. It got a lot of people involved and a lot of people recognition. And a lot of the little guys that don't always get recognition at a big level. So I'm going to end with this. <laughs> yes, we went to the AASLH conference in Buffalo um, to receive the award, and we got to go to Niagara Falls. I'm not bragging that we went to Niagara Falls, there's a point to this. <laughs> because we live in Utah in a high desert western state experiencing extreme drought right now, and Niagara Falls just has it's so much freaking water, guys. <laughs> um, it's just unfathomable amount of water is going over those falls, like from lake to lake to the ocean, and we're here in the middle of a drought. But it also serves as a reminder that water is one of the most universal things. Everyone has a water story. That's one of the hashtags of Think Water Utah is my water story. And um, we, how we use, need, and interact with water is so diverse. If h show today was put on in New York and Niagara Falls, where there's so much water in the air, it's just so, so humid, 
um, in Florida where, you know, they just had a massive hurricane and the consequences of way too much water in any form were here where, you know, it's extreme drought, no water, whatever. Um, all these exhibits or presentations in these locations would be so completely different. And that's what made H2O today truly special because we were able to take this universal element of water and determine how it's important and unique to Utah's past and future. That's all I have. <laughs> All right, it looks like we have about 15 minutes for questions if anybody has anything to ask. And Megan, you can't cry because then I'll start crying. <laughs> no more crying. <laughs> and I'll bring you the mic if, if you want. I was just going to say, <clears throat> I'm from New County Heritage Museum. We still have our map. And I purposely put a scuff on it and told Megan that Highland deserved better than a map that was scuffed up. So, <laughs> I, because I wanted to keep the map and it's still there today, and I hope it lasts for a few more years. And when it wears out, I'm going to demand a reprint <laughs> because it's such a good conversation starter with people coming in from out of state to see the two different watersheds and how completely different those watersheds are from each other dividing our state, but um, the kids love it, the adults love it, everybody loves it. So um, yeah, it probably will never go away. I have a question about the map and how how it was installed in each site. So is this, was it the same fabric material and you have different floors everywhere, so. Yeah, it's just a, it's a printed vinyl floor um, and we have different adhesives that can either keep it secured to uh, carpet or to tile or wood. Um, so at each facility, it's just using the right, uh, the right adhesive on the ground. But, doesn't ruin the floor after it's peeled up, but um, and then making sure that those edges are, you know, really well secured so no one's tripping and yeah. One other question while yeah. I have you, when it came to reprinting uh, the fabric panel or a graphic, what was that turnaround like when you had to send that in? I mean, we're talking days, weeks. I'd say it was probably about two weeks a two week turnaround time on, on average. Um, luckily nothing was, I mean, aside from those Sintra panels that Court, Courtney mentioned, but none of the fabric panels were ever so damaged that they were unusable. Um, I think, yeah, really just those Sintra panels. And I, I wanna say that turnaround time on the Sintra was one, one week, yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Sorry. As long as we knew what we needed, um, having a production company in Salt Lake City was really um, was really handy because it wasn't shipping stuff up from like Ohio or anything. Um, so we needed to stay on top of our local hosts, like, oh, hey, your exhibition's coming down in two weeks. What's wrong with it? What do we need to fix? We've got to, you know, turn around time. I'm JK Homer. I work with Inside Exhibits and Chris and the entire H2O Today team. And I also want to say that, uh, bring it up that the, the exhibits actually have longer longevity than just the uh, centers that we set them up in. Any of the materials that are not being recycled back to certain centers or spoken for uh, displays of what they want, we're actually taking the SCG fabrics that have gone around the room and we're making them into backpacks and bags that you can shop for your groceries and quilts for certain uh, reservations and things like that. So there is a lot of longevity to it. And I'll just add to that. So this particular exhibit, um, we're recycling the framework. So uh, several of the museums that had the exhibit and others uh, associated are, are taking the B matrix framework or taking 
Um, I mean, we can't give them a, the copyrighted Smithsonian content, but um, we are having some of that ICG fabric made into bags for, you know, presents for all of our enormous statewide exhibit team, um, and project team. Um, we're also taking the Utah content and leaving it down at the Canyon Country Discovery Center because we hold the copyrights to that. Um, and so there'll be a small exhibit with the Utah component staying down in Monticello for as long as they want to have it up. Is it possible to get a copy of this presentation? Sure. If you want to email me, I'll give you my email after. If you, if you two consent. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Thank you. So fascinating. Um, I'm curious what one would need to do to get a map like that. I'm a geography educator doing an intensive um, three-week course on water in Utah, and this would be perfect. Um, and I'm wondering uh, what content I could have access to or if that is available. Um, and then did you have any educator resources? Did you reach out to like what was available? Yeah, so just off the bat, if you want to get with JK here, he'll, he'll give you a card. Um, he can get you a, yeah, a floor map. In terms of educator resources on our Utah Humanities website, I think it's utahhumanities.org forward slash thinkwaterutah. Um, we have the waterways essay that you can check out. We have a link to our Beehive Archive, which is a weekly radio show with two minute episodes that are all about water for the last season. So there's hundreds of episodes at this point. And then we also had a teacher guide made by Lisa Barr, who's, hello Lisa. Um, and I believe that is on our website as well, isn't it? So the teacher guide is on the UEN local history, Utah history resources. There's a Utah Humanities, there's a bunch of wonderful resources pro provided um, from all over the state. Utah Humanities has a bug on there that you can click and the teacher guide for um, Think Water Utah is there. Um, it's a primary source guide uh, geared toward analysis of images um, and historic images. Um, there's also the, the Smithsonian uh, sent a ton of educator resources along with H2O today and um, waterways actually, and all of those are linked on the Think Water Utah page. Um, and local sites have the freedom to use what they wanted. Um, the H2O opening site, uh, the Cultural Celebration Center in West Valley, uh, partnered with the Utah Rivers Council to create um, part of their outrageous curriculum, which is high school curriculum around water. Um, so there's a very nicely developed um, curriculum around that that's specific to Utah. And right now it's Utah Archives Month and the theme is water. And so they've created an entire website called utaharchivesmonth.org with resources to all sorts of water resources, online exhibits and stuff like that. So check that out if you haven't either. And I think Archives is doing a session later as well on with a bunch of people, yeah. Thank you, just a technical question. Does Inside Exhibits do the fabrication or do you guys outsource that? Yeah, we do fabrication in-house. I don't need a, a map. It's for the scene. Oh, oh yeah. so well, I'll Thank you. Um, how long did it take to, like, from conception to when it was rolled out? How long did it take to get this on ready to go? So I think it was about six months. We were trying to re recall how long this took. Um, and I think we started conversations of, about August 2020? No, uh -huh. I'm totally off base again. Yeah. We were trying to remember right before this. And since it was COVID, like there was no sense of time. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty sure you're right. August 2020, we really were like going and then. But conceptually, it was longer. Yeah. Conceptually, it was much longer than that. Um, the Smithsonian had had been um, the Build It Yourself exhibition was something that they co produced with H2 with. At, Sorry, the Build It Yourself H2O Today exhibition, they produced it at the same time as they produced the Museum on Main Street traveling exhibit, um, Waterways, and uh, we're shopping it to 
chopping it around as you know as a pair and i tried to find a host in Lake, in in utah that would want to build it while we had waterways and um was not able to find someone who wanted to build it so we decided to build it to build it and travel it in the same way that we travel um the museum on main street exhibitions um and so that conversation had started way back in you know 2018 2017 um but we you know, contracted with Insight right after the plague started um, to have that conversation. But it had been, we had been researching and figuring out what we wanted to do well before that. And shameless plug, our next museum on Main Street exhibit is called Crossroads, and it's going to tour to eight Utah locations across the state, and it's all about rural Utah history. Just one thing I want to know is that, um, you know, being top of mind as I'm looking, there's lots of museum folks here, lots of history folks here. And so um, everything that Utah Humanities does, these types of programs is based in scholarship. Um, so of course, you know, we've talked about the essay, the Greg Smoke, he's at any time there's a tour, they hire a state scholar, but then all of these 30, 40 programs we did had a scholar, a tradition bearer, a tribal elder, an expert attached to every single one per requirement. And so I feel like this is also a great case study of how public history and cultural organizations and scholarship, history scholarship have this really beautiful symbiotic relationship that affects the community in a much larger way when they're when they're synergizing like this. Darren joked about not having a bibliography for native sources the other day. My Ovi bibliography was three pages, plus the native sources. <laughs> so that's a lot of research. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I think we should have like all the Think Water Utah people in this room raise their hands because there's tons of you. Or stand and, up. <laughs> or stand up. And I just feel like you all amazing. Yes, we got one, two. I know there's more. There's Greg in the back. We got, yep. Darren, yeah. Amazing. And thank you so much. <laughs>